Okay, let's start recorded. All right, Chong Ren is today's moderator. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. So welcome to the Accounting Design Project Workshop. And my name is Chung Na Lee, and I'm from University of Hong Kong, and I'm the moderator for today's session. We are happy to have Robert Hills from Penn State University to present his paper titled um, Accounting Information and Disaggregated Credit Risk. Uh, we have a few house rules. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please virtually raise your hand. I mean, click the raise hand button in Zoom or you can type your questions in the chat box as well. And I will do the monitoring and allow you to ask questions in order. And please mute your microphone when not talking to avoid any potential background noise. And if you feel comfortable, please turn your camera on. And without any further ado, let's welcome Robert. And Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I'm happy to be able to present today. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Ayang and then I guess Stephen, who's actually uh, wasn't able to make it today for Organizing this accounting design project, I think it's a great opportunity to uh, collaborate amongst one another and discuss important accounting issues. So my co-authors, I know, are, are happy to have the opportunity to share our research today. Uh, so the paper I'm presenting on is titled Accounting Information and Disaggregated Credit Risk. Uh, so this is a paper. I'm Robert. I have it with my two co-authors, Matt Kubik and Catherine Shipper. Uh, and a young was just asked me how long we've had this paper, and I, th I think it's probably about six or so years that we've worked on this project on and off. Uh, although, even though it's a somewhat of an old project, we have yet to submit it to a journal, So, and some of that's because we worked on and off. So we're still looking for feedback. We're undergoing, I would say, hopefully our last major revision in preparation to get this submitted to a journal in the next couple of months. And so we're very welcoming of feedback or suggestions that, pe that people have. Uh, so let me get into a little bit more about the paper. Uh, so before I talk about our research questions and kind of the motivation and then our design, I wanna just make sure that we're clear about what we Robert, mean. We cannot see your slide, excuse me. So slide is not shared, I guess. Oh, uh, they're not sharing again? Okay, let me fix this then. It's probably when I went back to go. Thank you for interrupting me. Let's yeah, see so again. <laughs> uh, okay, is it working now? Yeah, it's loading, I think. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it should be up in a second. Then I have a switch. Okay. Can you see it now? You're good, okay. All right, so let me uh, talk a little bit about our overview of our paper. So I want to make sure we understand what we mean by disaggregated credit risk in our setting. So I think most of us are aware of credit risk kind of at the aggregate level, at the borrower level. So here in our paper, when we talk about disaggregated credit risk, we're conceptually kind of boiling down that credit risk into two components. The first is going to be probability of default, which is the likelihood that the borrower fails to meet their, or their ongoing debt obligations. And by default here, we specifically mean debt service default. So the borrower fails to meet, it's either periodic interest or principal payments. And this is going to be an entity level assessment. Uh, two reasons for this. One is the first most important reason is the data that we have, the data provider has selected this as an entity level assessment. Although conceptually, I think this makes sense if you're aware of the way that many debt instruments are structured, is that there's commonly cross default provisions. So if a borrower has more than one debt instrument, if they default on one, the creditors on the other debt instruments will treat it as though all uh, instruments were effectively defaulted on. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Then the second component is of this of credit risk is going to be loss given default. And as it suggests, this is the loss that's incurred by the creditor or creditors once the borrower has defaulted. Uh, now, this is going to be an obligation or instrument specific assessment. Uh, and the reason for this is conceptually, of course, the, if you look across the instruments within a borrower, there could be different contractual features. So securitization or collateral is going to affect the loss that a particular creditor or set of 
creditors incurs given that there's a default situation. And then secondly, if the borrower actually goes into a bankruptcy proceeding, right, there's going to be some priority structure that's um, set out uh, for the claimants. And so certain claimants are going to receive priority over others. And this will in turn affect the loss given default associated with a particular debt instrument. Okay. So although the loss given default originates or occurs at the instrument level, it can be aggregated to the entity level. And so in the data that we use, the data provider does provide an entity level uh, loss given default for uh, like entities that have already defaulted. And we're gonna try to construct one ourselves in expectation as well, mainly for comparability purposes with respect to probability of default. Uh, so now let me get into our research question. So we have two main research questions in the paper. So the first one is, to what extent does accounting information help explain variation that we see in these two disaggregated components of credit risk? So PD being probability of default and LGD being loss given default. And I want to preface our findings for this first uh research question because it's the motivation largely for our second research question. And so when we examine this first research question, what we find largely is that accounting information does a pretty good job of explaining variation in probability of default, but doesn't explain much variation in loss given default, okay? And so our second research question, I want to call it a second, not secondary research question, because in some ways we think this perhaps may be even more important is why does accounting information explain uh, so little variation in loss given default? Okay, now our purpose or motivation for this paper is at a conceptual level, we know that a purpose of financial reporting, a primary purpose of financial reporting is to provide decision useful information to investors or resource providers. Uh, this includes, of course, both debt and equity investors. In our paper, we're focused on debt investors. And we're interested in understanding whether and how these investors or these creditors, that could be both current and potentially future creditors, use accounting information along with other sources of information to derive expectations about their future returns or future payoffs. And we're going to conjecture that in doing so, in deriving these expectations, it's important for the creditors to make assessments about both PD and LGD, so probability of default and loss given default. Our, our, our third motivation here that I have as a bullet point, this I kind of added this because uh, I know a purpose of the accounting design project um, based off the email that I got from a, a young was to, of course, identify current issues, say, in accounting, but also, if possible, make um, policy recommendations. Now, I'm going to be really cautious about making uh, policy recommendations, but one thing I think our paper sheds light on is that there may be potential opportunities for accounting information to provide more timely or relevant information for creditors. And what I'm talking about here is, as I'll show later in the, in the presentation, is we provide some evidence that suggests that intangible assets are particularly useful or meaningful for the creditors in deriving expectations about their payoffs for a isolated set of observations that are say approaching or close to default or perhaps already in default. And we think that this finding is maybe surprising or a little bit counterintuitive relative to some say historical arguments that have been made in the accounting and finance literature. Uh, now it is somewhat consistent with I think uh, some emerging or recent research. So I cite this paper by Kermani and Ma, uh, 2022. Uh, this paper looked at a at estimated liquidation values that were made for a set of firms that were in chapter 11 bankruptcy. And they looked at the expected liquidation values, which is something that I guess is required to be performed for firms that are in chapter 11 bankruptcy. And they show that intangibles actually seem to have a relatively high 
say liquidation value or, or even for the set of firms that are in a bankruptcy situation. And uh, I feel, okay, a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. yeah, okay, go ahead. Hi, Robert. I just have a quick question about the intangible assets uh, closer or in the event of default. Uh, is that limited to patent or is also covers non-patent, for example, human capital or when equity, that's the harder to evaluate or identify the intangible assets. Yeah, so, so I think your question is about which of these intangible assets potentially do carry value in, in situations like a default situation. Uh, so we can speak a little bit to this. We haven't done a formal analysis. I'll get to this more in our next slide, which I'll go there right now. But one thing we look at is, and I'll talk a little bit more about detail in this, is our fresh start asset measurements, where we observe uh, for a set of firms that are emerging from Chapter 11 bankruptcy, they uh, there's an accounting prescription that requires them to remeasure their assets to fair value. And so we can see at the line item level, for example, intangible assets, here's the value at default in the post-emergent entity, as they're emerging from chapter 11, here's the reassess value of intangible assets. Uh, some firms will provide more granular data, which I think you're asking about is, what's the particular intangible assets? If you see that they go up in value, is is that associated with which, which particular intangible assets? Uh, and so we haven't, we have antidotes. I don't think I can say specifically across the board, but it seems to be the case that there's a wide variety of intangible assets. So some, I'll look at an example here in a minute about GM and they have things like customer lists that actually have a lot of value. So it's not only um, patents, but it probably is intangible assets that could easily be transferable, if we want to call it that. Does that make sense? That could be, whether it's a patent or a customer list that could be useful to another entity as well. Just a quick follow-up. I think if the acquirer is a public traded company, you can actually take a look at their purchase price allocation after the acquisition to see what type of intangibles actually are writing up. Right. Yeah, so that's exactly true. So normally on, on their gap, the only time we can see the value of intangibles being placed on the balance sheet is during an acquisition. Generally, they're not... So when I'll get to this in a, in a minute, these fresh start asset measurements, one thing that's unique about those is it's effectively prescribing ASC 8045, so like a business combination. So the entity that's emerging from Chapter 11 bankruptcy, they place on their balance sheet, or, or I should say, not only do they revalue pre-existing intangible assets that would have been acquired, but they're actually able to recognize internally developed intangible assets on their balance sheet, which we think is somewhat unique as an accounting setting to use for answering this uh, this research question that we're interested in. Okay, so let me move here to a, kind of our research design. And I've structured the presentation here to cover three sets of analyses that we perform. And I'm gonna also preface our kind of high level findings associated with each set of analyses. So. Our first set of analysis, we're looking at the relation between accounting information and expected or ex ante measures of these disaggregated credit risk components. And so our general design there is we have expected measures of probability default PD or LGD, and we're regressing those on pieces of accounting information. So like accounting ratios and so forth. Um, and we're interested in to what extent does accounting information explain variation in these ex, ex ante measures of PD or LGD. And as I mentioned earlier, the kind of high level finding here is that accounting information does a, a pretty good job explaining this variation in ex ante PD ratings, so probability of default, but doesn't do a very good job of explaining uh, variation in, in LGD ratings. This is rather robust to, at least in our mind, various research design choices. So if we use different pieces of accounting information, if we adjust the accounting information, so say creditors are more interested in, in forward-looking information, performance measures, so instead of net income, maybe they're interested in EBITDA 
if we look at adjusted piece of accounting information, we generally find the same uh, inference that account information explains PD, variation PD ratings pretty well, but not LGD, okay? Another thing we look at here is trying to rule out the fact, or, or the, not the fact, but the possibility that LGD ratings are just very, very hard to explain. So is it unfair to say accounting information doesn't explain LGD ratings very well if nothing can explain LGD ratings? Well, we do find that other pieces of information, so say like contractual features of debt instruments, or perhaps even macro information can explain uh, LGD ratings. It's even more so than accounting information. So it doesn't seem to be the case that LGD ratings altogether cannot be explained. Uh, I see there's a chat. Um, I'll, Congran, is that, uh, is that a question that I need to look at or is that something else? If not, I'll proceed, I guess, if the chat's not. Okay, I didn't look at the chat, but I'll, I'll proceed on them. Our second set of analyses, now we're looking at a set of observations in which the borrower has, off, has actually defaulted. So we have to set aside PD here because that's been realized, PD was one. And so we're looking now at what is the realized or ex post uh, loss given default, or alternatively, we call this the recovery rate, where recovery rate is going to be one minus the loss given default. And so our design here is we're looking at recovery rate and also the recovery or resolution outcome as a function of accounting information. And the reason we look at the resolution outcome as well as the rate is to a large degree, the recovery rate is driven or highly associated with the resolution outcome. Where the outcome, what we have in mind there is if a borrower defaults, what's the final resolution of that default? Do they is the borrower that default are they acquired? Did they go through chapter seven liquidation? Did they go through chapter 11 uh, reorganization and reemerge? And then the final outcome we have based off the data provider is a distressed exchange where the pre existing creditors essentially restructure or exchange their current debt instruments for perhaps new debt instruments or maybe equity to allow the, and the, and the result is that the borrower is able to continue as a going to concern without going into bankruptcy because they kind of restructure their debt prior to going into bankruptcy. Okay, what we find here is that our interest coverage, leverage and intangibles seem to be helpful in predicting not only the resolution outcome, but also oh, the fun. recovery rates. And particularly intangibles has a positive relation with this recovery rate. So more intangibles at the time of default are associated with higher recovery rates. And Robert, uh, can you hear me? Robert? question, Kent? Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Uh, just a short question for clarification here. There is obviously a distinction here uh, between LGD, loss given default, and the, the recovery outcome. Could you please explain that once more? Because first I thought that the loss given default was what I lost, but it is not obviously. And you're asking, just to make sure I'm clear, you're asking distinction between recovery rate and loss given default? Yes, yes. Okay, so the, the loss given default, this is, and of course here when we're talking about loss given default in this second set of analyses, this is going to be a realized loss given default. So the entity went to default situation, everything's been resolved, and then we can observe what's the loss that was actually incurred by the creditors. And then by creditors, I mean all creditors across, uh, across the firm, across the borrowing firm. And so the recovery rate, like for example, if the loss given default were a creditor lost 50% of their initial investment, their loss would be 50%. The recovery rate would then be 50%. It's one minus the kind of percentage rate there. Does that make sense? So if uh, alternatively, the loss mm -hmm. given default were 80%, the recovery rate would be 20%. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of trivial. I, I thought that there was some kind of difference in assessment here so that the um, 
recovery rate could be something different than one minus the loss given the fault. But that's not the case. Uh, yeah. So, no, it's not, it's going to be, yeah, it's, it's trivial. It's, it's just the one minus. Now, it okay. could, of course, Thank here, remember, I'm this is. Sorry. Okay, just go on. Okay. Perfect. Well, glad we could clarify that. Okay, then our third set of analyses, as I mentioned a minute ago, we look at these fresh start uh, asset remeasurements. So for a set of firms that enter chapter 11 bankruptcy after they default, and, and chapter 11 is the most common outcome of default, that's true in our sample. And I think that's true across most bankruptcy type samples I've observed. Uh, for certain firms that enter to chapter 11 and then emerge, there's a specific accounting prescription or treatment that requires the remeasurement of the balance sheet. And in our setting, what's useful is the assets. And we go into SEC filings, collect information about this. And what we observe is that on average, intangible assets are commonly remeasured upward, whereas tangible assets like property or PP&E are often remeasured downward uh, when applying this fresh start reporting. And to give a little bit more information about, about this, let me go to the next slide. Because uh, we think this is a kind of novel feature in our paper, is this fresh start reporting, this is applied on two con when two conditions are met as a firm is emerging from chapter 11 bankruptcy. So first was that the that there was some balance sheet insolvency, which I think is relatively common if, if a firm is in bankruptcy. So the primary qualifying criteria for whether fresh start reporting is applied is that the holders of the existing voting shares of the firm, so before emergence, receive less than 50% of the voting shares of the emergent entity post-emergence. So this largely is going to arise when there are creditors that are exchanging their previous debt shares for equity as part of the reorganization plan of the uh, of the emerging entity. Okay, So that's largely what leads to or facilitates the prescription of fresh start reporting. As I think mentioned to a young earlier, when fresh start reporting is applied, uh, if you go and read the in the codification, it's prescribing effectively ASC 805, which comes from business combinations. And so the assets are remeasured as if they were effectively acquired. Okay. And importantly, so not only if when it comes to like intangible assets, not only is the emerging entity going to revalue their intangible assets that were already recognized on the balance sheet because they presumably acquired some other entity at some point in the past. But they're also going to remeasure or place on the balance sheet now any inter internally developed intangibles that have a fair value greater than zero. Okay, and that's true for intangible uh, as well as goodwill. Uh, so let me look at a, an example of this. So uh, General Motors is one firm that's in our sample, and, and you're probably familiar that they experienced a bankruptcy kind of at the tail end of the financial crisis in, in 2009. And this is their fresh start reporting balance sheet. And all these fresh start reporting uh, disclosures generally follow this similar format where they have four columns. First column would be the entity at the date of default. So in this case for GM, that's July 9, 2009. Second column, they have some uh, Section 366 sales that are part of the bankruptcy code. So satisfying some initial settlement settlements of creditors. And then the third call, and this is what we're primarily interested in, is the fresh start reporting adjustments. So these are the remeasuring of their assets uh, to fair value. And we focus uh, to a large degree in the paper on three asset classes, which I have highlighted here. So property or PP&E, goodwill, and then intangibles. And if you look down here, what we observe is with respect to the PP&E, the revaluation of these tangible assets uh, property causes the value of, the, of this particular asset class to drop by about more or less 50%. So they're revalued downward. Uh, 
goodwill at the time of default, there was no goodwill on the balance sheet of GM. After revaluing their assets to fair value, they then have uh, 30 billion in goodwill that's placed on the balance sheet. And for intangible assets at the time of default, they had 210 million on the balance sheet that was recognized. And then as a result of these fresh start remeasurements, they place on the balance sheet an additional almost 16 uh, billion in, in intangible assets. And so Ayanga was asked the question about what type of intangible assets. So GM is actually pretty nice and they provide a little bit more detailed information about uh, the underlying assets that make up say property or intangible assets. So I have some of that information here. Their disclosure is more detailed, I would say, than other firms. So we look up here, this is some additional disclosure they provide about their uh, property or PP&E and the revaluation of those various underlying asset classes. And you can see that for most of these line items here these within property, they are revalued downward. The one exception is land, which is actually revalued upward. On um, their intangible assets, they don't actually provide a, I would say, value of the assets prior to the revaluation. Presumably that's because if we go back a slide, they only had 210 million of intangible assets and they have over 16 billion. So it's probably the case that many of these intangible assets were not even recognized or had zero value, at least on the balance sheet prior to default. But you can see that a lot of these uh, intangible assets, they have quite high valuations when remeasured to fair value. And they're across a variety of um, topics. So you have some contracts, dealer networks, um, intellectual property. Uh, so I don't know if that shed some light on, on, on your question. This is, of course, just one, one antidote. Uh, hi, Robert. Uh, this is super interesting. Um, can I just ask a question based on what you showed on G, on the, the site before, right, GM? So I was wondering, have you considered the, the impact of how lenders utilize information or perhaps even undo whatever they added in the intangibles? Uh, because, you know, like there is one, there's one thing I, uh, I think that happens actually in between the usefulness of accounting information or whatever change in accounting information and uh, loss given default or probability given default, that is the lender, how they utilize the information, right? Uh, one thing they could perhaps do if, if they think this is gonna be detrimental to the loan quality, they can just somehow remove this effect from the contractual terms. So have you guys thought about that? Uh, and are you asking whether we see, whether we looked at like, do lenders just remove like intangible assets from like contractual features, like covenants in their loan contracts or something like that? Is that, is that uh -huh. question I think, Right, that's part of it. It's like, um, so uh, I, I, I'm wondering like, what's the mechanism for, for them to impact loan? Loss given default is it actually without lenders' response uh, uh, response in between, or there's something that lender can do to mediate the that because they definitely care about loan quality when they uh, can uh, do uh, the terms. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, perhaps unsatisfactory. I I can't say that we've done much to look at at least in this paper about what are the considerations that lenders make in say redesigning their debt contracts from the entity that were associated with the entity prior to default and then going through to emergence. We haven't looked at that. Um, that's something interesting. Uh, I know there are, there's other literature that has examined, not with this particular setting of, of uh, entities that are close to default, but has examined you know, how frequently are intangible assets included or excluded from consideration in debt contracts. Um, but that is not something that we have currently done um, at the moment. So yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a good, can't shed any light on that or answer the question. We just haven't done anything with that yet. Um, all right, um, let me get into our first set of analyses now in more detail. 
The, so here we're looking at the relation between accounting information and expected or ex-ante measures of probability of default and loss scale default, these disaggregated components. Uh, we're going to get expected measures of probability of default or loss given default. We're using um, Moody's disaggregated credit rating. So Moody's is unique among the major credit rating agencies in that not only do they consider the disaggregated components in kind of their conceptual framework for deriving uh, credit ratings, but also they issue publicly uh, separate or disaggregated ratings, so PD and LGD, uh, or at least they've done so since 2006. Now, I should point out that this Moody's disaggregated ratings, they're only issued for a particular set of entities. So if you think about Moody's credit ratings, right, they follow this alphabet oriented scale. And Moody's is only going to issue disaggregated ratings for non-investment grade borrowers. So borrowers that are all else equal closer to a default situation. Now the conceptual reason that Moody's makes why they don't issue separate PD and LGD ratings for investment grade borrowers. If you think about like a borrower that has a AAA rating, say like Apple, they say, it's so difficult to envision the state that Apple would have to be in at the time of default relative to where they're at now that predicting loss going default is almost like unreasonable. It doesn't even make sense because they would have to be so structurally different to, for Apple to go default that using their currently available information is unreasonable to drive an expectation about loss going default. And so that's why they're focusing only on non-investment grade borrowers or borrowers who per, are presumably closer to a default situation. Now, because of that, of course, we're going to have the general caveats with respect to generalizability that our sample is limited to a set of observations that are all it's equal closer to default. Uh, yes, Ayana. Hey, Robert, I just have a question related to this. So when Moody's issue uh, loss given default, Previously, you mentioned that they also issue it for each instrument, right? So for GM, GM will have one probability of default, but GM may have different loan facilities. So Moody's will actually issue loss given default for each uh, instrument. And, yes. and within each instrument, the realized loss given default may differ across lenders within each instrument. So in your recovery test, it's also at the individual lenders level or it's at the facilities level or it's at the entity level? Um, yeah, so this is a great that? question. Yeah. So for, for this, this analysis, we're looking at these expected PD and LGD measures. So the as you correctly pointed out, the PD is at the entity level, the LGD is at the instrument level. So for our setting, what we're going to use is we're only going to look at um, subordinated debt instruments for deriving an expectation about loss given default because these are the ones where they actually if they have like collateral behind them the loss given default is going to be really low so i for loss given default we're only going to be looking at subordinated debt and we're going to create a weighted average across uh, across that borrower now in most cases the if you have multiple subordinated debt they generally actually have the same or assess or assess the same loss given default in most cases. So I think we have, if out of these 28,000 observations, we end up with firm quarter. We have, let's say, 5,000 or so where they have loss given default instruments that differ. And even when they differ, in most cases, they're very, very small, like 58% and 56% or something like that. Um, that's because we're, of course, selecting only subordinated. If we went to go to senior debt, loss given default would be much different. So that's how we're going to construct for ourselves an entity level loss given default measure in expectation. In our second set of analyses, when we actually look at realized recoveries or one minus loss given default realized, Moody's does, uh, because uh, once a 
default situation has occurred and then the resolution has gone through, they can actually observe at the firm level the overall recovery rate. And so in that case, we don't have to estimate anymore. They're, we're given a, this is the firm wide or borrower level recovery rate. And then one, one follow-up question. Uh, the reason I asked you this is that how do we interpret your results, right? So like for probably, you say that income statement information is more useful uh, or high, more highly correlated with the probability of default yeah. and balance sheet information is more correlated with the loss given default. I wonder is whether that is because the loss given default measure is conditional on subordinated debt. So like how do we interpret the useful um, in that situation, yeah. Yeah, so in, a, in earlier versions of the paper, we did have both senior and subordinated, but in that case, we did not create a firm quarter loss given default measure. We just looked at it by instrument. We had similar findings that, that it was still, the balance sheet was more important, whether we looked at just senior debt separately subordinated or all together. So those inferences cha doesn't change. We changed the structure because we felt like it was confusing to a reader when we did a firm quarter analysis for PD and then the observation count went up to like, a, you know, from 20,000 to like 100,000. And and so it was confusing. So because our inferences didn't change, we tried to make it, I guess, more understandable to a reader. What was our, and it didn't change the inferences is, is why we've structured it how we currently have it. Good. Sorry, I missed that from reading. The no, paper. no, I don't think that's still in the paper. But yeah, so but that was why we currently have a structure the way we do. That's that's a good question though. Okay, so now that I talked about how we are getting these expected PD and LGD measures, then we need now need pieces of accounting information. So currently, we we are looking at primarily two income statement measures, so interest coverage. And then a volatility measure, so which is earn, standard deviation of earnings scaled by the standard deviation of cash flows. And I should get my pointer out so you know what I'm talking about. And then we have two balance sheet measures, which is leverage and book value of equity. And in our all of our regression specifications, we're also controlling for the size of the firm or sizes uh, total assets. Okay. So, oh. I'll stop for a minute and let you ask your question, Kent. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I mean, this area of uh, research using accounting numbers to predict defaults or bankruptcies, it's an extremely mature area in yeah. accounting research. It goes back 35, 40 years. So then my question would be, why did you pick these measures? And um, why do you think it is important to make a distinction here between income-based measures versus balance sheet measures, because then you are missing the opportunity of combining them. And, uh, and I mean, in many studies, measures of return on equity, return on asset, asset turnover can be found to be of importance. So I'm, I'm just a clarifying question. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a good question. Yeah, so the you. reason we were interested in, uh, and, and I agree with what you said at first, there's been a large literature that it, uh, examines the relation between accounting information and probability default. They may call it bankruptcy risk or, or other types of things. Yeah. Uh, the relation between accounting information and loss given default, I think, is much less examined. And so part of the reason we selected income statement and balance sheet was there's some conceptual arguments in prior literature that suggest that one of the purposes of accounting information is, uh, particularly on the balance sheet side, is to provide creditors with an expectation of what they can expect to receive uh, for, given like a default situation. So kind of suggesting that it may say something about loss given default. Now, in the regression specification, which I'll get to in a minute, although we have income statement and balance sheet measure, we do put them in together at the same time to see overall uh, what's if we combine both sets of information what's the explanatory power when including both income statement and balance sheet measures uh, does that answer your question well i mean I, I i can see that you combine both but uh, i mean for example a measure like um, operating income in relation to total assets that is not present in your uh, okay. series of, of the predictors 
so so it's the combination yeah so you're saying something like a like an roa measure yes some yes. return on for, ex assets. for example <clears throat> yes uh so what we've done i would say at the extent of this and let's see if i can link to this here is we have this is one of the table of paper where we look at the relation between expected pd or expected lgd in relation to various other pieces of accounting information which i think would include some of these pieces of information like roa which you talked about and generally we find similar inferences in the sense that these other pieces of accounting information explain pd quite well and don't do a very good job about lgd and part of the reason why we selected the accounting variables that we did there it's some guidance on prior research so some of the credit rating or, or bankruptcy papers suggest that these are important measures of these volatility and interest coverage and so forth. Also, we were looking at Moody's own methodology with respect to their overall corporate family ratings. So Moody's issues reports are about their methodology or how they go about driving their aggregate credit rating. And we were following some of their approach to select these variables. Now, if you look at this table, we are largely selecting variables that seem to be the most, I guess, if you want to call them important or have the largest coefficients in R squared with respect to PD. Um, so we could, of course, include other pieces of accounting information. We could just have a very uh, long regression that has many variables. And we have looked at this. It didn't change our inferences. So that was one reason, I guess, we, we tried to be simple at the moment because it didn't change our, our main inferences with respect to this first set of analyses, which is that accounting information explains PD pretty well, but doesn't explain LGD. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, I don't have a big argument with regard to your inferences here at the end of the day, but um, um, I, I thought that, I mean, I did this once upon a time a hundred years ago, and found, for example, that interest cost measures interest cost in relation to financial debt was quite informative. So, I mean, if you're looking for the best performance that one can get yeah. from accounting information, then I'm a bit worried that you might not be capturing the best possible information that you can get from financial statement information. Okay. And I agree with you 100% there that if our, and maybe we need to be more clear about our objective, if our objective was to maximize say our r squared ex explain as much as possible um and we can put this in the paper we've looked at including you know almost every imaginable counting variable and it does increase the r squared moderately um but not enough that it's going to come close to change our inference that the counting information explains more variation in probability of the default than it does for loss given default and so while we agree with you that of course that we, our current specification may not maximize our explanatory power, I think is kind of what you're suggesting. I completely agree with that. We might just need to be more clear about what our what our objective is. That That's not necessarily our, our objective in this setting, although I recognize that it is in other papers and, and that's a common um, objective in this literature that wants to explain just PD or bankruptcy risk. That's That's not our objective necessarily here. Okay, let me uh, get to some results. So initially, if we just look descriptively at the relation between, this is our expected probability default measures and pieces of accounting information, so interest coverage or leverage, for example. And this is true if we look at book value of equity or our volatility measure, we see that there's a monotonic relation between, just descriptively between PD and these pieces of accounting information. Now, alternatively, when we look at the relation between LGD and these pieces of accounting information, this monotonicity just kind of disappears. And so this just initially suggests to us that uh, there's not much, there's not a very strong association perhaps between these pieces of accounting information and loss given default, while there is a rather strong relation between probability default and these pieces of accounting information. And to more formally get at this, we, we put this in a regression specification. So here, initially, we're looking at regressing 
these expected measures of probability default on in column one, this is gonna be our income statement information, controlling for size. In column two, we're looking at our balance sheet information, of course, controlling for size. And then in column three, we put, put all the information together. And we see here that if we look at the adjusted R square, which is what we're kind of we're honing in on here, that accounting information seems to explain at least decently well this variation that we observe in PD ratings. Uh, and, and of course, we point out, as Young mentioned, that the income statement does a better job of explaining variation in PD than the balance sheet. In columns four, five, and six, if we then look at, instead of PD ratings, loss given default ratings, what we observe is that the adjusted R score initially is much, much lower here. Okay? And we see that the income statement doesn't do a very good job at all explaining variation in loss given default. Balance sheet does a little bit better, but overall the R squared from columns four through six is much lower than what we observe in, in columns one through three. Okay. And to be clear, uh, we talked about this in paper, let me just clarify this here. So to remove the threat of outliers, we were decile ranking our piece of accounting information here, as well as actually our outcome measures. That's not too difficult with our outcome measures because PD is already kind of in a because of the, uh, the alphabet oriented measures, they're already, already at kind of in deciles. And LGD, we place into deciles in buckets of zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, so forth. Uh, so we, right off the bat, we, we observe this kind of discrepancy in the ability of accounting information to explain PD versus LGD. We look at various reasons why this may be the case. One of the things that we could look at right now, I guess from a little bit, how much do I have, 13 minutes? I'll look at some of these analyses and I wanna to get to some of the other second and third sets of analyses. So we won't talk about all of these, but one of the things we do look at initially is, is the inability or lack of, of accounting's ability to explain this variation in loss given default. Is that because accounting information would actually explain loss can default better if the borrower were really, really close to default. So if a borrower were closer to default than the features of their accounting information, so the structure of their balance sheet would be perhaps more reflective of what the creditors would observe in a default situation. Okay, so this is something that's conjectured, I think, by Moody's as well as other analyses. So to get at this, one thing we do is we split our sample on the uh, probability of default or financial health of the borrower. Okay, so we look at column one here, this is going to be firms that have a lower probability of default, so less likely to default. And column two is then gonna be a set of observations where the borrower is closer to default. And the expectation based that we kind of had going in here is Perhaps it's the case that accounting information is more useful in explaining loss gain default as the borrower is closer to default. However, we don't really find evidence that's very consistent with that, right? We see uh, adjusted R squares are, are comparable across the two columns. Okay. Um, and something else that we then look at is, as I mentioned early on in the presentation, is we were wanted to know whether it's the case that it's just very difficult to explain variation in loss given default ratings altogether. And so it's not necessarily that county is doing a bad job, but loss given default is just difficult to explain altogether. So we look at some other pieces of information, non-accounting information. Here we're looking at some contractual variables associated with the borrowers. So what proportion of their debt is senior secured? It's a bank facility, it's a revolving line of credit. And we observe that these features do explain substantial variation in loss given default. So if we look at column five here, the adjusted R square is 22%. And then what this suggests to us is it's not necessarily the case that loss given default measures can't be explained at all. It's just that accounting information uh, perhaps isn't best suited to doing that as currently constructed. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna skip over some of this. So we look at adjustments to County information, I mentioned this earlier. So instead of using like net income, if we use EBITDA or other measures, and they 
they moderately change the explanatory power, but not anywhere near that's going to change our inferences. Okay, so I have 10 minutes left. Let me talk about our second set of analysis now in more detail. So here we're accessing a set of observations that have experienced defaults. Uh, so we have 740 or so observations. This is coming from Moody's default recovery database. And these, all of these observations, they have defaulted. We can observe what was the resolution outcome, meaning did they, was the entity acquired? Did they go through chapter seven liquidation and chapter 11 emergence and so forth? And we can also observe what's their recovery rate at the entity level, right? And so one of the first things we do is we just look at what's the recovery rate by resolution outcome. And so you can see here, distress exchange, this is from the creditor's perspective, the most favorable outcome because they have the highest recovery rate. So recovery rates, you know, above 75%. And this according, and these definitions are coming from Moody's because we're using Moody's database. In their mind, a distress exchange is effectively, it's a, an agreement between the borrower and the creditors to restructure the debt prior to entering a bankruptcy. So bankruptcy is avoided. The entity continues as a going concern, right? So <clears throat> this, I think, from a creditor's perspective is the most ideal uh, situation because uh, it leads to the, the highest outcome. And you can see that, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, chapter seven liquidation is going to be associated with the lowest uh, recovery rates. And this is consistent with, with, I think, other research as well. I think we cite uh, a Leon and Ma paper that shows that chapter seven is the least desirable outcome for most creditors because it, when the assets are liquidated, the recovery tends to be lower for creditors. Okay, so to look at, oh, let me stop. Kent, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Uh, a short question here on your previous slide here. Oh, yeah. uh, when it when it comes here to firms that are um, uh, resurrected or acquired, um, how how do you then measure the uh, recovery value? Is do you have market values for debt after they have been acquired or if they have been resurrected, or is it book values? Uh, so you're saying when they're acquired, how do we know the recovery rate? Yes, so Moody's is going to use it's effectively the payoffs relative to their contractual obligations that the actual creditors receive, even in the in the acquisition setting. That's what they're going to determine as the recovery rate. So if the bar, if you know, in a simplified example, if the creditors were owed a thousand dollars and they ended up getting paid off seven hundred the recovery rate would be 70% or loss given default 30%. So in this case, because we're relying on Moody's, we're not going in there and calculating this ourselves. That's my understanding of what Moody's is doing. Okay. No, so that's for saying, acquisition. Did you ask about another resolution outcome? No, I mean, the question was, if they remain as creditors in a firm, uh, yeah. they perhaps cut down their credit amount by 20, 30, 40%. So then after this kind of if a firm has been acquired, how, how do they then value the oh, debt? Okay. Because I mean, we, we we want to have some kind of idea about the market value here. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't. I maybe maybe I need to go look in, at this in more detail for acquisition. I don't know exactly. My understanding is just from what Moody's tells us is that okay. they're going to assess the the payoffs to the creditor relative to what they were owed. Okay. Uh, but I don't. I'll have to go look in more detail. I don't have a satisfactory answer probably for you there because okay. I don't. No, fair enough. Yeah. Um, a young. I'm going to be quick because then you only have six minutes left. That's so fine. I think earlier you talked about that they can write up uh, intangible assets uh, when they are entering into chapter 11, right? And that yeah, is so this is a specific case. Yeah, a specific case of chapter 11. Once they've reemerged and they met those two qualifying criteria I talked about earlier. 
So I'm wondering that the recovery rate here for chapter 11 and being acquired is about 10% higher than chapter seven. Is that due to those intangible assets? And then later on, if the company actually impair those intangible assets, does that come back down to similar recovery rate to the chapter seven? Um, so I guess two questions. The the recovery rate is not a, I guess I want to say the fresh start remeasurement doesn't affect the the oh. recovery rate. Other than if you had intangibles, you may have a higher recovery rate, like because the creditors value, you know, the firm is valued more, but it doesn't, the actual revaluation doesn't then just, it doesn't artificially make the recovery rate higher, I guess was your, was your question there. The second question I think is, is important about uh, do the intangible assets that are measured upward, are they eventually impaired at some point in time? I don't know the answer to that. We haven't looked at that. That's a, that's a good question. I just, I don't, we haven't looked at that yet. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, Peter. Hi, uh, thank you. Interesting paper. Uh, just a quick question. The expected recovery rates, um, behind them is presumably an expected fresh start valuation. Um, and the, the valuations might be thought of as depending on the power of the different debt claimants. Um, for example, you know, if there are um, vulture funds, um, owning subordinated debt, yeah. uh, they will tend to favor in negotiations, higher fresh start values to, to gain a greater slice of what's left of the cake. And vice versa, if you know, the, the powerful debt investors are, um, are uh, higher, higher ranked uh, in the pecking order of debt. So is it reasonable to think of the recovery rates as um, being based upon some understanding of who has power in the event of bankruptcy? Uh, I, I think that's that's true. So for example, if, if we look at our, let me flip over here. If we look at the outcomes, so we see that leverage is related. So if you're more leveraged, you actually, which you, you think it means more debt relative to assets, you're less likely to be liquidated. And I don't know if that's because you're hopeful as a creditor that liquid, if liquidation is going to be your worst outcome, do you want to have the entity continue as a going concern? Because if you liquidated them and the leverage is really high, losses are going to be higher. I don't know if that's the case. Um, but you think you bring up a, a broader point that's important is, is there some, I don't know what we want to call it, gamesmanship going on amongst creditors, whoever has priority to determine not only the outcome, but as, as you mentioned, these fresh start revaluations, they are performed by experts, but they're, they are more or less agreed upon by the creditors in order for the firm to emerge from chapter 11 bankruptcy. So these are questions that I don't, I don't know the answer to, but I think they're, they are important things that we probably need to consider is, is there con, internal conflicts across creditors, I think is what you could summarize here. And I think one, one of the related points is uh, there's a paper, Clive Lennox has a paper, which talks about uh, auditor going concern opinions and the conservatism in, in the accounting pre uh, pre bankruptcy of firms uh, subject to uh, going concern opinions, okay. which would affect some of the measures on the right hand side here, like the book value. Yeah. Um, if you are well, I guess we'll have this recording i said i'm not familiar with that paper be ha i'd be happy if you send it to me because i'm not familiar with that but that's i think that's important consideration sure will do um i guess i have probably one minute is that about <laughs> okay so the last thing this is just descriptively i'll put this up before before and so these are our fresh start cases which we actually hand collect information descriptively this is just plotting the change in value of intangible assets uh based off the number of observations. We actually see a lot of cases in which, and the reason it goes to infinity is that in many cases we observe that there were no intangible assets on the 
default entity. But now because of this fresh start remeasurement, they actually have intangible assets, in some case, a lot of intangible assets. And you can compare and contrast this with the change in the value of PP&E, okay? But we do see in some cases, PP&E is remeasured upward. It's much more common that it's actually no change or, or uh, decrease in the valuation. All right, so we're out of time. So kind of main takeaways, we show accounting information seems to be of first order importance in explaining PD, but, just, but less, much less important in explaining LGD. Um, one potential explanation that our, our descriptive results seem to be consistent with is that it, it could be the case that intangibles play an important role in recovery rates, but they're largely unobserved or missing from the balance sheet, at least at the time of default. And we think this is consistent with other recent findings about uh, intangibles being important when looking at estimated liquidation values. Okay, um, Very grateful and appreciative of all the helpful suggestions we had today. And, and thanks again to Ayang and Stephen and the Accounting Design Project. And let me go to our, our last slide. Here's the next, next session. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yep, thank uh, you. Chen Ray, um, I'm going to stop recording. All right.